to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. With summer coming up, I do want to encourage you to pick up your Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt if you haven't. We have three different designs available in different styles as well as in a wide variety of colors. We have our regular Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt at uh, t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. We have our Yours Truly Johnny Dollar anniversary t-shirt at yourstruly.greatdetectives.net. And our Joe Friday Never Said Just the Facts Man at friday.greatdetectives.net. Summer is coming, so get appropriately attired. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is November the 10th of 1953, and the title is The Bobby Foster Matter. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Walter Jackson, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Jackson. How are you? Oh, not too good, Johnny. That is, our company isn't. If you're not on a case, I'd like you to conduct an investigation for us. I'm at your service. Good. Our company writes a group health and hospitalization policy at the Riggs Bearing Company. Where's that? In Riggs City, Florida. Employees 3,000. We cover the employees and their families. And? We've just received a claim on behalf of a Bobby Foster, the child of a machinist of Riggs. For what? For an operation involving a team of neurosurgeons and technicians that had to be flown to Riggs City by chartered plane from Boston. Now, what do you want me to do? Now, Dr. Grant Howell, director of the Riggs City Hospital, attached a report to the claim. A report which we think bears investigation. Okay, I'll get right on it. Fine, Johnny. And don't spare any expense. If Dr. Howell's report bears out, there's a vicious racket spreading. A racket which victimizes children. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy... That good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Medical and Hospitalization Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bobby Foster matter. Expense account item one, $85.56, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Miami, Florida. Item two, $2.60, bus fare between Miami and Riggs City. A spick-and-span little town with coral white streets shaded by tropical trees. I registered at the Kachubi Hotel, then went directly to Dr. Howell's office in the modern air-conditioned hospital. Good afternoon. Hello. May I help you? I'd like to see Dr. Howell, please. Well, the doctor doesn't see patients after five. I'm afraid you'll have to return tomorrow. Unless it's an emergency. Well, I understand it is. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm representing National Medical. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. That's all right. Is the doctor in? Well, he's looking in on a patient, Mr. Dollar, but he expects you. Oh? The insurance company phoned you were coming. I see. It's pretty awful what happened to little Bobby Foster. 
I've never seen Dr. Howell so upset. Just exactly what did happen. You don't know? Not the details, no. Well, if Dr. Howell is right, it's... It's, it's terrible. But uh, he'd better tell you. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Dollar? Oh, thanks. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Let me see. I, I had some matches. Oh, here you are. <laughs> it worked. Hang out the flags. Well, how do you like Rig City, Mr. Dollar? Well, I haven't been here long enough to know. How do you like it, Miss... Uh... Uh, Rogers. Flo Rogers. I haven't been here very long myself, just a little over two months. Oh? Oh, I like the sunshine, the clean streets, but... But what? It gets a little dull. Well, is that so? Well, maybe something can be done about that, Miss Rogers. It uh, is Miss, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. Good. I'm glad you approve. I not only approve, I applaud. Oh, on behalf of the Spinsters of America, I thank you. <laughs> oh, that must be Dr. Hall. Excuse me? Reluctantly. <laughs> the doctor will see you, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Oh, come in. Come in. Have a seat. Thanks, Dr. Hall. Well, your company acts fast. Only mailed that claim day before yesterday. National Medical feels it's an unusually high claim, You're doctor. suggesting I padded it? Oh, certainly not. But a team of neurosurgeons flown down from it Boston... It's necessary to save the boy's life, I assure you. Well, don't misunderstand, doctor. National Medical isn't challenging your professional opinion. Mm, I should hope not. The reports you attached is what interested my company. It should. It should interest the whole country. I didn't have the opportunity to read it, doctor. Perhaps it's you'd... a potential child killer, Mr. Dollar. A vicious, unscrupulous racket, capitalizing on panic, fear. Well, come with me. I want you to see what they've done to an innocent child. Bobby Foster? Yes. Any change, nurse? No, doctor. Well, there he is, Mr. Dollar. A five-year-old boy. Victim of a panic-stricken parent and a criminal operator. What are his chances? We won't know until he comes out of coma. If he does. And then? For complete recovery, no chance. For partial recovery, a fair chance. Bobby Foster will be paralyzed. You said a criminal operator. Who? If I knew, Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't bother with reports to insurance companies. I've been a doctor 40 years now. Seen a lot of pain and tragedy. But this... This... Let's go back to your office, doctor. Uh, sorry, Mr. Dollar. I must be overtired. Shouldn't let these things get to me. Well, after seeing that boy, I can't blame you. Cigarette? Yes, thank you. Now, let's have the story from the beginning. Well, <clears throat> we, we had a polio scare here recently. Some of our children came down with fever, headache, sore throat, symptoms resembling polio. Was it polio? No. But to confirm my diagnosis, I called in a polio specialist from Miami. Meanwhile, epidemic rumors spread through the town. Parents got panicky, held a mass meeting. For what purpose? Uh, they demanded I inject every child in town with gamma globulin. That's the polio preventive? Yes. And did you? Certainly not. Gamma globulin is impossible to get unless a genuine polio epidemic is threatening. The government has to ration it carefully because one whole blood donation is required to manufacture a single injection. You know how many demands there are on the whole blood supply these days. Of course. Well, to get to Bobby Foster's case, I was called to the Foster home last week. Found the boy in a coma. He had all the symptoms of embolism. Of what? Cerebral embolism, caused in this case by an air bubble entering a blood vessel and being carried to the brain. Well, that would cause paralysis, wouldn't it? Yes, and possible death. And so you called in the neurosurgeons? I didn't feel qualified to undertake such a specialized operation. Well, just how did the air bubble enter the boy's bloodstream? Through criminal carelessness, by way of a hypodermic injection. Any proof? Well, the needle mark still on the boy's arm. 
And you have no idea who injected Bobby? None. But I know this. Other children in this town have been injected, too. Oh? In their cases, fortunately, no harm was done. Well, surely Bobby's parents know who injected him. That's the wicked stupidity of it, Mr. Dollar. They deny the boy was given any kind of an injection. But you think they're lying? Of course they're lying. The boy was running a fever. The parents thought it was polio. They panicked, took him to some quack for an injection of what they were told was gamma globulin. At a black market price, no doubt. To a frightened parent, price would be no object, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'll see the boy's parents. They can be persuaded to tell who's behind this racket. You're wasting your time, Mr. Dollar. I've tried repeatedly. They refuse to admit their responsibility. Afraid criminal charges will be brought against them? Perhaps. But they have another child, a girl, seven. You're thinking the girl has been threatened if the parents talk? I wouldn't put anything past the ghouls who operate this racket, Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, it would figure, Doctor. Well, thanks. I'll check with you if I turn up anything. Just do that, Mr. Dollar, and be careful. I always am. And you ease up, huh? He's very perturbed, isn't he? Ernie has a right to be, Miss Rogers. Uh, do you have the Foster's address? Oh, yes. I, I prepared this for you. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Well, I'll take a run over there now. Oh, I see. wish I could help you. You've been very helpful already. No, I, I mean really help. If there's anything I can do, a anything you need or need to know. Well, I could use a little background information, you know, about the town and the people. I tell you what, why don't we have dinner tonight? Then I can get the rundown on Riggs City and a little nourishment at the same time. Well. You have another engagement? No, no, I haven't. Just that, well, I didn't want you to think I was angling for a date. Oh, now, look, I have a pretty good memory, and I distinctly remember that I asked you to dinner. I, I know, but. I think it's your civic duty to dine with me. <laughs> well, if you put it that way, as a good citizen, how can I refuse? That's the spirit. You name the place. Well, there's a. A restaurant called The Tropics, a bar and grill sort of place. It isn't 21, but it isn't bad either. I'm with you. What time shall we meet? Around 6. I'll be there if I have to crawl. <laughs> All right, but wouldn't a taxi cab be more practical? <laughs> See you at 6. I left the hospital with the sound of Flo Rogers' laugh still rustling in my ears. It occurred to me that Riggs City might be a very pleasant place under different circumstances. I hailed a cab and ran up expense account item three, 75 cents, fare and tip to the Foster's bright little cottage, a stone's throw from the beach. Yes. Mrs. Foster? Yes. I represent the National Medical Insurance Company. We have insurance where my husband works. Uh, just a minute, Mrs. Foster. Please. I said we already have medical insurance. Yes, with my company. Oh. I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? No. That is, my husband is It'll only home. take a minute, Mrs. Foster. If it's about the premiums, I can't help you. They're supposed to be deducted from my husband's paycheck. It's about Bobby. I can't answer any questions. You have to see my husband. I think you have the information I need. What information? About the injection Bobby had. He, the one he that didn't. nearly caused his death. No. You're wrong. Bobby didn't have an injection. Dr. Howell says the needle mark is still on the boy's arm. No. Is someone threatening to harm your other child if you talk? Please, go away. Please. You have a moral obligation, Mrs. Foster. I can't answer any questions. Other children are being victimized, too. Could end up in the hospital like your son. Please. Only half alive because their parents were panicked into buying phony drugs from the black market. We were, we were so worried that Bobby had polio. So worried. Who gave Bobby the injection? I, I can't tell. I can't. You've got to tell. But our little girl, Margaret, they said Karen, they... That's enough. I, I didn't tell him anything, Edward. Get inside. Where's Margaret? Inside, I said. Oh, so you're Bobby's father. That's right, mister. I'm Johnny I Dollar. know who you are, insurance company detective. Investigate. Have it your way, but get off my property. Did they threaten your little girl if you talk? I'm warning you. You can get police protection, Foster. Just name the man who gave Bobby that shot. I don't know what you're talking about. I... Now, 
You get off my place. Use your head, Foster. You're covering up for the worst kind of scum. Talk. You owe it to your son, to the other kids that are being victimized. All right, Dollar. I warned you to get out. Don't be a fool, Foster. I won't. (laughs) Get off. I didn't come here to brawl with you, Foster. I'm investigating... I said get up. Get on your feet and clear out of here. Since you asked me so nicely, sure. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. My face and my clothes were pretty much the worse for wear. I went back to the Kachubi Hotel for a shower and a change and a little elementary first aid. It helped, but not much. What with one thing and another, it was nearly 7 o'clock by the time I got a cab and ran up expense account item 4, 85 cents to the Tropics Cafe. I spotted Flo Rogers in a corner booth. Well... Hearty greetings and humble apologies. Good evening. Don't apologize. After all, you're only an hour late. I'm sorry. I had a little repair work to do. Repair work? Johnny, what happened to your face? I was overmatched. I lost the decision and it wasn't close. Someone beat you up? Well, that's one way of putting it. Mr. Foster did the honors. But why? He thought I was a little too inquisitive. Oh, Johnny. He must be an awful man. No, he's a frightened man. Frightened out of his wits. His little girl's life has been threatened. What? How do you know? Mrs. Foster was on the verge of admitting it when her husband barged in. Oh. Oh, Well, what are you going to do now? Starting tomorrow, I'm going to question every parent in town. Do you think other children have been injected? Well, Dr. Howell thinks so, and it figures. A group of grifters move into a family town, spread polio rumors around, then make a killing selling phony gamma globulin shots to parents who are scared silly for their children's health. Johnny... Yeah? You're going on with this investigation? Why, certainly. In spite of what's happened to you already, you're determined to go on? Why, sure I am. What are you driving at, Flo? I guess I'd better tell you, then. Tell me what? Well, tonight, when I first came in, I sat at one of those little tables near the bar. See, that one over there, behind the jukebox. Yeah? So? I heard the bartender whispering to a man. Well, what did he say to him? He was telling him where to take his child for an injection. An injection? Of gamma globulin? I think so. I couldn't be sure. I couldn't hear everything he said. Where did he tell the man to take his child? Did you hear that? No, I told you. He was whispering. The man he was talking to, is he still around? No, I I don't see him. Did you know him? No, he was just one of the customers. Okay. Thanks. Where are you going? To dig my elbows in that bar. You run along home. We'll have that dinner some other time. Promise you'll be careful. On my honor. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. That makes two of us. I settled on a stool at the bar and ran up expense account item five. Ten dollars and seventy cents. For more than a few double bourbons. 
With which I slowly drank myself into a mood so dark that my neighbors moved to the other end of the bar. Hey. Hey, Skinny. Come here. Name's Mickey, sir. I told you before. Well, so you did. So what? Well, don't just stand there, Skinny. Fill me up. I think you've had enough, sir. You need a cup of coffee, black. What I need, you can't get for me, pal. Nobody can. You sound like a man that's got woman trouble. What do you mean, woman's trouble? Well, my little wife is the finest, sweetest... Yeah, sure, sure. You're crazy about her and the kids, too. How do you know I got kids? Well, you're the type. Family man. No kid. No kid. Now, look, I'll get you that coffee and then a cab to take you home to the kids. Okay? Okay. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. Come here. Yeah? You're a swell guy, Skinny. You understand... When a man's got troubles. Yeah, sure. Forget it. Just that my kids are sick. My wife is worried half out of her mind. I had to get out of the house. I had to get away for an hour. You say your kids are sick? Yeah. Wife's scared it's polio. What does the doctor say? Oh, a lot of mumbo jumbo. Everybody knows there's a polio epidemic in this town. The doctors are afraid to admit it, because they can't get the stuff to stop it. Gamma globulin? That's the only thing that'll save my kids, the only thing. Uh, listen, mister, maybe I can help you. Huh? Get you some gamma globulin. Where? Where, Skinny? I'll pay anything, anything. Here, go to this address. The party there will tell you where to take your kids for the shots. Oh, thanks, Skinny. Thanks. The name's Mickey. Oh, sure. Mickey. Don't worry. I won't forget you for this. Well, I'm not worried, mister. I left the Tropics Bar and piled into a cab. On the way to the address Mickey had given me, I stopped at a highway diner and ran up expense account item six. Thirty cents for a carton of steaming black coffee. Not that I was in need of sobering so much... I just wanted something to take the sudden chill off my spine. If you've ever had a date with a grave robber, you know what I mean. It was 2 a.m. when the cabbie dropped me at the driveway of what looked to be a deserted beach house. I paid him off, expense account item 7, dollar and 20 cents tip and fare, and started up the drive toward the vine-covered gate. That's far enough, dollar. Who's there? Oh! Just shut up or I'll snap your neck, Dollar. Foster! That's right. Don't give me any trouble. Okay, okay. But ease up with him. Will you come along easy and no funny business? Yeah, yeah. All right. Put All your right. hands behind your head. <coughs> Clasp them. And don't turn around. Okay. <laughs> Where's your gun? I didn't bring one. You've got less sense than I thought, Dollar. I had my reason. Let's go out the gate. My car's down the road. <laughs> Foster drove away from town, using the back roads, a tire iron clutched in one huge hand in case I got ideas. Once, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw the big guy's lip tremble, like a scared kid. He finally pulled up beside a long, sleek auto trailer, parked in a lonely beach cove. He motioned me out and followed me to the door. Hello, Johnny. Well, Flo. Surprised? No. You're working with a bartender, aren't you, Flo? <laughs> of course. He's my husband. Hmm. It figured. Oh. Come in and tell me, Johnny. And please be good. Just as long as you have that gun pointed at me. I'd hate to. But I'd use it, Johnny. That figures, too, Flo. Foster. Yes? Yeah. Wait in your car. Good. Oh, cozy, these trailers. Mickey and I like this one. Sit down, Johnny. I'll fix your drink while we wait for him. No, thanks. Oh, you're pouting. You're disappointed in me. Not very. Tell me, 
Why weren't you surprised to find me here? On the way over here, I got to thinking. This afternoon, when I met Foster, he already knew my name. I hadn't given it to anyone but the doctor and you. <laughs> Careless of me to have mentioned your name when I warned Foster you were coming. Just what kind of a hold have you got on him? His little girl. You've kidnapped her. Oh, no, Johnny. We're just keeping Margaret for a little while. You see, the Fosters had been very responsive to Mickey's warnings. But then you came into town. And, and... drastic measures were in order. We haven't harmed Margaret. How did you get her? Foster came by the hospital after you left to see his son. He left Margaret in the waiting room. And you phoned your husband? Mickey's wonderful with children. She was tickled pink to go for a soda with him. Real sweet people, you and Mickey. We really hate this, Johnny. Believe me. Yeah, sure. What happened to Bobby Foster was an unfortunate accident. Who gave Bobby the injection? Mickey, I can't stand the sight of a needle. Some sweet racket. Oh, we do very well. Traveling from place to place, taking jobs. Following the epidemics like a pair of buzzards trailing a stray. Self-righteousness doesn't become you, Johnny. What do you charge for a shot? Fifty dollars. What's in them? Nothing harmful, just colored water. And once in a while, an air bubble. That was an accident. I'll take the gun, Flo. Oh, Mickey, I didn't hear you drive up. Everything all right? Foster did exactly as he was told. Good. Yeah. Low dollar. You play a lousy drunken father. I'm usually better, but tonight I didn't extend myself. Huh? I had a hunch you'd want this meeting to take place before I started questioning the other parents in town. Because you knew I was bound to find a mother or father who'd identify you two. Oh. Then you've been willing to make a deal all along, huh, Dollar? Well, let's say I hated to spoil your fun, especially Flo's. What's that crack mean? Ask your lonesome wife. Don't listen to him, Mickey. She plays a very convincing bachelor girl. He's trying to make trouble. A little too convincing. Shut up, Dollar. And she talks a lot. Talks? She told me everything just now. Even that you've done away with Foster's little girl. What? I didn't. I said... Mickey, behind you! Oh, it's cold. Oh, a gun, Foster! Get it. Shoot, Mickey, shoot! Oh. I'll take the gun, Flo. Let me go. Now sit down and behave. You, you hurt me, John. Give it to me, Dolly, the gun. I'm going to kill him. No, Foster. Give me the gun, Dolly. Your girl's all right. I said you... You understand me? She's all right. You said he killed her. Well, I had to. It was the only way I could (laughs) shock you into making a move. You're not just saying it, Dolly. Margaret's really safe. Tell him, Flo. Yes. She's all right. This case deserves publicity, Mr. Jackson. Lots of it. Scared parents make easy dupes for operators like Flo Rogers and Mickey. And when innocent kids end up the victims, it's intolerable. Dr. Howell tells me that all the gamma globulin manufactured goes to the Office of Defense Mobilization, where it's distributed to local health departments, who in turn pass it on to MDs only. Expense account item eight, $94. Bus, plane fare, and incidentals between Riggs City and Hartford. Expense account total... $196.96. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint gum every day, and we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, 
brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Don Sanford with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Frank Nelson, Mary Lansing, John McIntyre, Jeanette Nolan, and Tom Tully. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. You know, sometimes you listen to old-time radio, and it feels like that uh, world was not all that different from the world of today. You know, you listen to The Man Called X, and you hear say, some of the same conflicts that we are dealing with today were issues back in 1952. And then you have uh, stories where you listen to it, and it seems like it's from another world. So, some background on what was going on in the United States at the time would be helpful. Polio was such a great affliction in the country. Typically, the country averaged about 20,000 cases of polio per year. At that point, there was no vaccine. Even though research was underway, this took on urgency in 1952 as cases surged from a typical 20,000 per year to nearly 60,000. And in 1953, there would be nearly 40,000 cases. Now, this era had a lot of concern about polio. Gamma globulin was shown to prevent polio. However, it was a product of bone marrow cells and lymph gland cells. And so that limited the supply. And at the same time, America had just entered into an armistice in Korea. These injections were frequently recommended to travelers traveling to certain areas of the world for protection against hepatitis A. These days, we give people a hepatitis A vaccine when they're heading overseas, so we don't recommend that. But that was not the situation in 1953. So essentially, America had been having this surge of polio cases against the backdrop of regular demand, plus the strain that were placed on the availability of medical products. And there was an additional reason why the government was reluctant to release gamma globulin if there was not a polio outbreak in the community. Because of the way that it was made, it created risk that the recipient could actually develop hepatitis C. So if the government, you know, responds to parents just being scared and there's really not a polio outbreak in the community, you could end up making public health even worse by spreading hepatitis around. And so what this did is it created the perfect storm for con men to come in and exploit the situation. You have a parental concern about something that was not, you know, fictitious. And due to the nature of the treatment, it was not available except in extreme circumstances. I found this really fascinating to look into. Uh, I think that the, you know, and don't quote me on this, I haven't listened to my commentary on that episode when I did it back in season three, I think I just kind of gathered that this was about uh, the counterfeiting of medicine to treat children. And I don't think you actually need more than that to understand the story. It's like in The Third Man. You don't need to understand all the ins and outs of the illnesses afflicting post-war Vienna. But you look in at those... Uh, 
kids in that scene and see their suffering, and that's enough to tell you that Harry Lime has been up to some horrible stuff. I think that you could say that this episode of Johnny Dollar does fall under a category that, you know, those of us who grew up watching uh, television in the 1980s or early 90s would call a very special episode. Obviously, these sort of frauds were widespread enough that the program and Blake Edwards thought that it was vital to use the program to educate the public. So much so that you do end up hurting the quality of the mystery, such as it is. I, I mean, I don't know who wasn't immediately suspicious of this uh, lady. Her overall demeanor about the, what was going on is not what you would expect from someone working in a medical office. The way that she even talked about her boss's concern indicated she did not think this was a big deal, that he was obsessing over something that was not important when a kid had nearly died. Huge red flag there. Though again, I think the concern was definitely with informing the public as opposed to, you know, really challenging them with a great mystery. You know, and I can appreciate the need for uh, education, particularly on something like this, but it'd be nice if you could mix in a good mystery as well. Listener comments and feedback now, and we have a message from Darlene uh, regarding uh, an episode of Jeff Regan, episode 3670. Uh, and she writes in, big long time fan here. I wanted to comment on your remarks regarding the storyline of this episode of Jeff Regan. Like many others, it was written by a gentleman named William Frug. Bill was my college writing professor, and I learned a huge amount from him. At the time he wrote this, he would have been in his early 20s. He had a very long career in radio and television. In fact, if you look him up on IMDb, You'll be astounded by the number of television episodes he wrote that are now classics. He also went on to produce the series, classic series Bewitched. Given his talent and long career, I think I will cut him some slack over a radio episode he wrote when he was very, very young. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, well, thank you so much, Darlene. And it's a reminder of, to me, I think, to be careful in how critical I am of radio programs and their writers and cast. I think the first time I really, you know, got that sort of lesson and really realized I better be careful in how I, you know, do this is I received an email from someone related to Herb Ellis. And over the years, people related to Wally Mayer and Bill Zuckert have uh, contacted the, the podcast. Thankfully, I've, I, I've never been overly critical of them or really critical uh, at all. All were you know, fine uh, actors who were really important to the golden age of radio and, you know, contributed so much uh, to that. But it reminded me, you know, people might be listening who knew uh, people who help make uh, Golden Age radio programs. And obviously, it's always fair to, you know, criticize work. You never want to make it personal. You might think that the person involved is a historical figure, but they may have people who love and care about them listening. And I think that also comes into the category of I avoid, you know, going through the dirty laundry of people who make Golden Age radio programs. Now, that said, I don't think I was too critical of Mr. Frug. I think the main criticism I had of that particular episode, which was the one called This May Hurt Just a Little, is that it had zero relation to reality of how lawsuits and legal procedures actually worked. So you had things like... Opposing counsel, obtaining records, by bribing people rather than through discovery. But I don't even necessarily feel that's so much a criticism of uh, Mr. Frug because that really was just the way that radio writing 
work and you know film and television i think that you could have a motto for writers of courtroom scenes is never let reality get in the way of good drama so that's just the world that Mr. Frug operated in. So I don't hold that against him, really. He was a fine writer and I think did a great job with the Jeff Regan series with Frank Graham and uh, Paul Duvall. Really enjoyable. So no disrespect uh, intended to him. So I appreciate the comment and uh, for uh, you reaching out, darling. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporters of the day. We are celebrating folks who've been supporting the program for six years this month. I want to thank Jennifer, supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month, and Glenn, supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for all these years of support. And I do want to note that this will be the last month where we will be thanking folks on the sixth anniversary of their support for the program. It occurred to me to start thanking folks on the first Friday of the month on their five-year anniversary, but a lot of people had already had five-year anniversaries before that. So, in order to thank those we missed, we thank folks on their six-year anniversary. Starting next month, we're all caught up, so we'll be thanking folks on their five-year anniversary. First Friday of the month, starting in June. Uh, of course, we'll be thanking those with five-year anniversaries next Friday. That will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All that great stuff that helps the YouTube channel grow. We'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But coming up tomorrow, check out Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... We switched from car to our horses and turned the dog loose. He circled around for a moment, got his bearings... And then, despite the soreness of his body, started into a limping run. He's heading south, all right, Jace. Must be going to his master. Beats me why he went all the way to Peach Place, though. He had to go someplace for help. But the only thought he gave to himself was just stopping long enough to be fed before he headed back here. How far do you reckon we'll have to go? Well, we came 14 miles by car before the dirt road petered out. He came a lot farther than that. Might have taken him a couple of days. Well, we'll have to stop him at night. If he keeps going that long and time off, we better make sure we can catch him poor dark so he don't get away from us altogether. Uh, chances are he'll wait for us. After all, we're the help he came after. If he doesn't, we'll be able to follow him anyhow. In the dark? Yeah. I treated his collar with some phosphorus paint. Hey, whatever made you think of that? Uh, trick my father taught me a long time ago. Hey, look. Look where the dog's cutting, up in the foothills. Yeah. That's Ambush Canyon that way, isn't it? Sure is. See, no wonder that dog's so beat up. I wouldn't tackle this country in an army tank if I didn't have to. I wonder if that blind fellow would be alive when we find him. I don't think so, Sheriff. If he was alive, I don't think that... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.